Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. This is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here live in England with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, one of the believers had the question about Midrash, which you speak a lot of. When was rabbinical Midrash first established and was it used in the times of time of Jesus? When we say Midrash, we have to understand there are two Midrashes or two Midrashim. The biblical and the rabbinic. The biblical or the scriptural midrash, we see, for instance, in Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 22. The rest of the acts of Abiyah and his ways and his words are written in the midrash of the prophet Edo. We translate it treaties, but in Hebrew the word is midrash, midrash. Midrash is a compound word in Hebrew, midrash, from the drash. The drash is an inquiring into. Now, the New Testament, Jesus makes reference to this hermeneutic. He says, ye search the scriptures, you inquire into. Midrash as a hermeneutic is one thing. Midrash and the rabbinic writings written centuries later are something completely different. The scriptural midrash and the non-scriptural. We believe in the scriptural because scripture teaches it. We don't believe in the rabbinic. These rabbinic writings were written centuries later by rabbis who were largely anonymous. Not only that, but to understand this, there are two kinds of midrash, halakhic and haggadic. Halakhic comes from the Hebrew word to walk. It has to do with law and interpretations of the Torah. It's very legalistic. There is no halakhic midrash in scripture. It's something the rabbis invented. There is, however, haggadic from the haggadah midrash in scripture. The paschal liturgy that Jesus would have used at the Last Supper as a Passover Seder is called the haggadah. So, Haggadic is right. Halakhic is wrong. Scriptural is right. Rabbinic is wrong. Okay. Midrash as hermeneutic is right. Midrash as these legalistic rabbinic discourses are wrong. They're written centuries later. Now, there are ignorant people who will Google Midrash uh, on the Internet and think they're an expert. They behave quite stupidly. This has happened a number of times. They see these rabbinic writings called Midrash and say, oh, it's all wrong. That would be like saying there's Gnostic Gospels, like the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, which Islam follows and says is the true one, a fifth century forgery. There are Gnostic Gospels. There are false Gospels. That's like saying because there are Gnostic Gospels or a false Gospel of Thomas. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are wrong because they're also Gospels. We should get rid of the Gospels because there's counterfeits written centuries later. That's no different than saying we should get rid of scriptural Midrash because of these rabbinic discourses written centuries later. We must make a difference between the scriptural and the rabbinic, between the Haggadic and the Halakhic. Let's look. Yes. Midrash explains the way the New Testament handles the Old. We've said this many times, right from the beginning of the New Testament, and Matthew's the narrative. 
Out of Egypt I called my son. It quotes from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, which I'll read. And it applies it to Jesus coming out of Egypt after Herod dies. But when you read Hosea 11, 1, this is what it says. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. Out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning incense to idols. How can that be applied to Jesus by Matthew and say that's about Jesus? Liberal scholars like Professor James Barr, a professor of Hebrew who wrote the book Escaping Fundamentalism from Oxford University says, you see the New Testament takes the old out of context. The apostles didn't believe in interpreting the scriptures literally. Here, look at Matthew, uh, Hosea 11.1 1, as Matthew quotes it in chapter 2 of Matthew. Well, midrashically, it makes perfect sense. It's not out of context. The New Testament handles the Old Testament in the same general way the Dead Sea Scrolls does. It uses midrash. What Matthew was saying is, this is a typology and a Pesher interpretation. The Pesher is the spiritual replay and meaning of an event. In context, the Peshet, from the Hebrew word Peshut, Peshet, it's obviously talking about the exodus of the Jews under Moses from Egypt. That's the Peshet, the simple meaning. The Pesher is the prophetic meaning and the Messiah that replays it. Well, how does it replay it? God calls Abraham out of Egypt, and he judges Pharaoh. Abraham comes to Israel. Abraham's descendants, God judges Pharaoh, a wicked king under Moses. They come out of Egypt. They go to the promised land, okay? Jesus follows the same pattern as Abraham and as Israel. God judges Herod, a wicked king, and Jesus comes out of Egypt. That is the Pesher interpretation of the Pesher. As a Midrash, it makes perfect sense. It's not out of context. It's not crazy. It's not unscientific or rational, but only if you interpret the scriptures the way the early first century church did, the way the apostles handled the Old Testament. Now, Paul takes this further in 1 Corinthians 10. We come out of Egypt in our salvation. We've explained this many times. Egypt is a figure of the world. Moses is a figure of the God of the world and a type of the Antichrist. We come out of Egypt. Moses covers the people with the blood of the Lamb, brings them through the water, out of the dominion of Pharaoh, into the promised land. Jesus covers us with the blood of the Lamb, him being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As our Catholic friends say again, Agnus Dei Quitolus Pecata Mundi from the Vulgate, covers with the blood of the Lamb, brings us through baptism, the water, into heaven. It's a picture. It's a pattern. It is a Pesher. Yes, there's a simple meaning, the Pesher from Peshut. But there's a pattern and a typology and a prophetic fulfillment called the Pesher. Ultimately, it is a picture of the rapture and the resurrection. That's why Israel brought Joseph's bones with them out of Egypt. The dead in Christ rise first, we come out together. God will judge Antichrist, personified by Moses, uh, by Pharaoh, a man worshipped as God. As Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron, so the Antichrist and false prophet will counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. The whole thing happens again. We come out of Egypt. The exodus of the Jews is a type of the rapture and resurrection. The rapture and resurrection is a pesher interpretation of the exodus. Jesus coming out of Egypt when Herod dies is a Pesher interpretation of the exodus, of the Peshit, the simple straightforward meaning. 
Now, this is only one example. There are many, many, many examples. I simply use that one most of the time because it's the first one found in the New Testament in the formula citations of Matthew's nativity narratives. It's what it is. Yes, as a hermeneutic, as a method of interpreting scripture, that's the way the New Testament handles the old. It is not different, essentially, from what you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The way all Jews handled the scripture at that time. No problem with Midrash as hermeneutic. But as legalistic rabbinic discourses written hundreds of years later, even though they call themselves Midrashim, that's not the real Midrash. The real Midrash is what's in scripture, not what the rabbis invented a couple of hundred years later. The two should not be confused. We don't confuse Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as Gospels with the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas that the Muslims believe. Neither should we confuse the Midrash found in Scripture, taught in Scripture. Now again, it's a compound word, Midrash, from the Drash. The word Drash is found countless times, countless times in Scripture. A preacher in Hebrew is called a Drashan. He's the one who inquires into the text and brings out its meaning. In other words, exegesis. Now, Midrash is not at odds with grammatical historical exegesis. It incorporates it. But it takes it further. Certain Christian groups and sects who are evangelical throughout history have realized this. The early Plymouth Brethren realized it. They used Midrashic hermeneutics. Now, I realize there were problems with John Darby and so forth, but all the brethren were not like Darby. The brethren understood this way of looking at Scripture to a fair degree. So did many of the Puritans. Not all the Puritans were crazy people who burned the witches in Salem. They were good ones. One of them was their incredible scholar, John Lightfoot, who wrote a Midrashic commentary on the New Testament in the 17th century. The early church handled scripture this way in the first century, the Jewish church, the Judeo-Christian church. That is the hermeneutic of the New Testament, and it's the one we have to use. Let's look at Paul in the book of Galatians, chapter 4. Sarah and Hagar, the two women, the free woman and the slave woman, talking about the law and bondage to the law. How did he get that? It seems like a fairy tale if you only use grammatical historical exegesis. But when you look at it midrashically, it all adds up. It's there. It's in the hermeneutic. It is only by realizing that Paul and the apostles and Jesus were products of their time. God spoke to them directly, but within the context of their own time and culture. Second Temple period Judaism. That's how they taught. Now, I'm not saying people have to go back under the law or listen to the rabbis. No, they have to listen to the apostles and Jesus and the New Testament. The term midrash is found in the Bible, the term. And the base term, drash, is found many times. Jesus spoke of it. The apostles used it. Do not confuse the hermeneutic with the rabbinic writings from centuries later. Do not confuse the Haggadic with the rabbinic halakhic. They are two different things. The answer is absolutely yes. But thank you for your question. God bless. My name is Jacob Prash.